Good morning, good afternoon, uh, and welcome everybody that is join, joining us to this second virtual session of this workshop, uh, of Silela workshop, uh, Diagnosis to Management. My name is Carlos Chacon. I'm from the University of Costa Rica, and I will be moderating this uh, second session. For those people that, that join us in the first session, and for those that are just joining us from from this session, I will give you some basic information previous to the to the to the speakers we have programmed for this uh, for this day. The first thing is that this workshop is uh, organized in partnership from Escuela Superior de Agricultura Luis de Quiroz, University of Sao Paulo, through the Laboratory of Insect Vectors of Plant Pathogens, the Citrical Center Instituto Agronomico through the Laboratory of Biotechnology. This workshop is supported by CITED, the Iber X fast that is a network that is called Red Iberoamericana para la Vigilancia de Silela Fastidiosa. It is also supported by Department of Entomology and Acarology of the University of Sao Paulo and the Graduate Program in Entomology of the University of Sao Paulo. This workshop is, uh, was and is designed for researchers, professionals, growers, and students that want to update and, and, and have a brief uh, uh, knowledge of Silela. What are the goals of this workshop? To provide an update overview of the plant pathogenic bacterium Silela fastidiosa, its importance, classification, host plant interactions, transmission, detection, and monitoring as well as on management and certification strategies to provide training on a research techniques related to the pathogen and the vectors. The work program includes five virtual sessions that are, are programmed on tour days from 11 to 1 p.m. Sao Paulo time and that are broadcast through YouTube. And there is a second part that is practical sessions that are gonna be held uh, from September 5 to 7 at Brazil, at the University of Sao Paulo, at the City Culture Center, Sao Paulo State, Brazil. If you want more information for the whole uh, program and details, you can check the website of this workshop that is uh, there, that is going to be placed in the in the chat, so you can access this information. And you can, uh, in this website, also check out and, and to the links of the previous uh, sessions we are going to have that are going to be in the YouTube channel. Also, uh, if the people want to participate with questions, uh, you have to register in, in the YouTube channel so you can have access to this uh, function. Uh, how are we going to work? How the dynamic of this workshop will be that we, today we have four speakers. Uh, there will be no time for questions between speakers. The, the, the speakers will do their, their talk and we will continue uh, with, with the other pre presentations and so on. And at the end of the, of the four uh, speakers' presentations, we will have a debate where they will answer all the questions that uh, we received or some of the questions that we received through the chat on your YouTube channel. Uh, uh, you can feel free to, to put your question in any language you, you desire. We'll manage to, to make the best of it so the 
so that speakers can can give an answer to to your questions uh, also it's important that in some part of the session we will send you a link for the list of attendance this is important because if you attend to at least three of the five virtual sessions you will receive you will receive an attending and an attendees participation certificate for this so you need to participate in at least three but for that you need to fill in this a uh, uh, list of attendance that will be placed on the link on the uh, chat uh, during the, the, the during the speakers so this is all the dynamic we will be working and now we're going to start with this uh, sec second session that is uh, regarding all related to vectors so for now the first speaker and the first topic will be transmission mechanisms the speaker will be alberto ferreres from cesic spain alberto is an agronomist by universidad politecnica de madrid he has a master science by the purdue university in in 87 in agricultural engineering and and a phd in agricultural engineering by the universidad politecnica de madrid he has also a postdoctoral stay at the University of California, Riverside, and a sabbatical leave at the University of Illinois, Urbana Champion in the US also. Currently, he's, he's a research professor in the Department of Plant Protection at the Instituto de Ciencias Agrarias, Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas, Spain. Alberto Ferreres is one of the main experts in virus vector plant relationships, ecology of insect vectors, epidemiology, and control of insect transmitted plant pathogens, plant insect resistance, integrated pest management. Good, good afternoon, Alberto. It's a, a pleasure to introduce you. And the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your kind words and your presentation, Carlos. So it's a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to give a talk. Uh, should I pass my slides? Oh, OK. So I will be talking about transmission mechanisms of Silella fastidiosa. Thank you very much to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about Silella fastidiosa. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain a little bit which are the vectors of Silella fastidiosa. They belong, all of them, to the suborder Cicadomorpha mainly a uh, superfamily membracoidea, which are the ones that are more abundant in the Americas. Uh, they belong to the family Cicadelidae and Cicadelidae subfamily. The ones in Europe, though, are, um, although we have some uh, Cicadelidae also, which are potential vectors of Silella, we know now that the main vectors in Europe belong to the superfamily Cercopoidea, which are mainly from the family Afrophoridae. Uh, so the vectors in America uh, are not the same and are not the same species as the ones we can find in Europe. Also, uh, there are some reports that the Cicadas, uh, superfamily Cicadoidea, could be involved in the transmission of Silella, although this has not been confirmed and most of the studies uh, show that the transmission, if any, it's, it's very, very low and they are not relevant vectors of Silella. Okay, so how is Silella fastidiosa transmitted? Of course, it can be transmitted by grafting from plant to plant, but in nature, uh, Silella is transmitted exclusively by uh, insect vectors of the uh, suborder Cicadomorpha. It's a persistent uh, bacteria because the vectors, once the, the adults, once they acquire the bacteria, they persist uh, infective during their whole life. And also it's a propagative bacteria. Uh, it can multiply inside the vector but it does not circulate into the vector. It's retained in the cuticle uh, at the presivarial uh, region, and it's not uh, a circulative bacteria. So it's not transovarially transmitted either. And another property is that it's exclusively transmitted by silent feeders, 
during uh, silent feeding. So uh, another property is the acquisition is quite short, doesn't require too, ma too many hours. The insect needs to reach the, the silent, but this, this can be done very fast, as you will see later. And the inoculation can happen in a few minutes, as you will see. Uh, there is no latent period, means that when uh, the insect acquires the bacteria, it can transmit it immediately. And the nymphs can acquire and transmit, but they are not relevant vectors because they usually lose, they always lose the bacteria after molting. So actually the adults are the ones that are really involved uh, in the transmission from plant to plant generally, uh, and they are the ones that are uh, have epidemiological implications of the, of the spread of the bacteria. And as I said, the bacteria is mm, persistent in the adults and it, it can remain for the whole life cycle of the adult, which in some cases is one, one year. And so the place where the bacteria is retained, as I said, is in the presivarium where it forms a biofilm and it's retained and uh, multiplies in that region. Uh, regarding the types of transmission or mechanisms of transmission, uh, viruses, for example, have been divided in three major groups, the non-persistent, the semi-persistent, and the persistent viruses, because they show specific properties related to the speed of transmission, how long is it retained, what are the optimal acquisition or inoculation periods, and where is the, the, the virus located inside the plant. But Silella really does not fit into the three, in, into any of these three categories, because it's a persistent uh, pathogen, it persists in the vector, but it's transmitted more in a way similar to semi-persistent viruses, as I will explain later. Um, some considerations about the transmission of Silella. Well, um, as I said before, only silent feeders can transmit the bacteria. There are many insects that can acquire this bacteria because many insects are uh, able to feed from the phloem, from the silent. Uh, for example, aphids, silids, or whiteflies that are phloem feeders, they spend uh, quite a lot of time also in the silent when they want to drink from the plant and therefore they spend time in the xylem and they ingest xylem sap. So they can acquire the, the bacteria, but they are not able to transmit. The only ones that are able to transmit are the ones that are able to retain the bacteria in the presivarium region and then ingest the, the bacteria back to the xylem. And these are only the xylem feeders that I explained before from the groups of Thicalomorpha, which I, I already explained. The, the detection of the bacteria in the insect, therefore, does not mean that the insect is a vector. You can pick uh, insects in the field and they may not be vectors of the bacteria because they can acquire the bacteria but not transmit it. So, therefore, it's mandatory to make transmission tests from plant to plant in the lab and show that the specific or potential vector is able to transmit the bacteria from an infected plant to a healthy plant. Therefore, mm, in relation with the epidemiology of or the implications in the, for the epidemiology of, of the disease or, or diseases transmitted by vectors of Silella fastidiosa, I would say that they fit better uh, from a point of view of this classification that has been used um, quite often for, for insect vectors of, of plant diseases or, or virus diseases. They fit more into the non-persistent or semi-persistent category where the transmission occurs uh, within a few minutes after landing and probing, as I said before, it can acquire and transmit in a few minutes. And uh, therefore, um, species that are transient, species that do not colonize the plant, that can just land and probe for a few minutes in a plant, can actually acquire and transmit the bacteria. So they fit better into the non-persistent or semi-persistent uh, category uh, from an epidemiolog epidemiological point of view. Therefore, um, they are transient vectors, the ones involved, uh, species that may or may not be present in the, in the tree or on feeding on the plant when they acquire or inoculate the, the, the pathogen. This means that they have 
uh, they are difficult to detect, they are difficult to predict the epidemics, and it's difficult also to control the disease because they can transmit it very fast, which means that, for example, insecticides may not be very e efficient in reducing the transmission rate of, of this pathogen. Um, of course, in the spread in the field, you should look at the primary spread and the secondary spread from tree to tree. In the case of olives, it has been shown that the secondary spread from olive to olive is the most important way of, of spread of the, of the disease. And uh, of course, there are several parameters involved in the, in the uh, magnitude of infection or degree of infection, such as the number of vectors, the proportion of infective vectors are important, the degree of activity of these vectors, how many visits does it do from plant to plant, so depending on the number of visits you will have higher efficiency in transmission, timing of infection, the vegetative stage of the plant, and there has been several indexes that can be used to quantify the degree of infection. For example, the one developed by Irwin and Riesink in 1986, which deals with the activity and propensity of, of the vectors to transmit a disease, could be also applied in the case of, of Cybella and the vectors of Cybella. So now I'm, little, I'm going to change a little bit the topic and I will be talking about the transmission mechanisms. What do we do know actually what do we really know at this point on how the, the bacteria is transmitted by their vectors. So to understand the transmission mechanisms, we need to understand what's happening inside of the plant tissue and what is the insect doing when it's acquiring and inoculating the bacteria. And for this, uh, the, there is a technique which is called electrical penetration graph that helps us to understand the transmission of plant pathogens such as Xylella fastidiosa. So the EPG technique was developed first to understand the probing and feeding behavior of uh, aphids at the beginning, and also to understand how aphids were able to transmit uh, plant viruses mainly. So now it's being used to understand the transmission of many other pathogens. And uh, in the case of Xylella fastidiosa, there has been quite a lot of work done uh, on the how to relate the insect, insect feeding behavior to the transmission of silent. Mainly this work was has been done using the ACDC system uh, by the Ellen Bacchus in the 80s and 90s. And uh, now uh, there has been also some new work coming in related with DCPG, which is a, another um, are another way to understand the, 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 the feeding behavior of insects or another system to, to, to follow the, the, the feeding of the insect. And basically the, the procedure is the same, although the waveforms look not exactly the same, but they can also give a lot of information. For example, the DCPG can discriminate between the stylet penetration of the apoplast from the simplast, while the ACDC doesn't do this in most of its uh, uh, ways. So, uh, basically, those are the waveforms that uh, are related with the feeding of feeding behavior in this case of aphids, but this has been expanded to other insects as, as, such as Philenus pumarius, which is the main vector in Europe, and other vectors of Xylella, which I will explain later. For example, in the case of sharp shooters, uh, Bucephalogonia santopis, you can see here that the way they penetrate the plant cells, it's completely different from the aphids. Why the aphids do usually do intercellular probing, they don't break the cells. The um, sharpshooters and also the, the spittle bugs, all, the, all of those usually penetrate directly to the xylem intracellularly. So they go intracellularly, and this section of this photograph proves clearly how the waveform related with silent contact is related with this penetration intracellularly into the, into the silent vessels of a citrus plant. And the case of Philens respumarius is the same. They, it penetrates intracellularly straight into the silent vessels. And this is how they feed usually the sharpshooters and the spittle. Well, this was a video to show it, but I think it cannot be uh, projected through this system, so you won't be able to see. But I can explain a little bit how these um, insects feed on. 
So there is a, a valve called the presbyteral valve, and there are three steps usually. Uh, the relaxing step where the valve is closed, then when the, this muscle contracts, the valve will open, and then when it relaxes again, it will close back. So the fluids that penetrate here into the presivarium, into the sivarium chamber, will go down to the mesenteron. And while this um, valve is open, the fluids will be uh, projected inside. But if this valve is not closed, the, some of the fluids could also go back into the plant, which is called the egestion. So this egestion mechanism has been always thought the way of, uh, or proposed as, the, as a way to, uh, for this group of insects to inoculate uh, Silella fastidiosa. And this has been uh, ha hypothesized uh, for long ago since the beginning of the 90s, and then uh, in 2005, uh, the group of Ellen Bacchus proposed that this bacteria was inoculated by egestion. So the fluids that came inside um, under negative pressure, because the silent is under negative pressure after the, the insect uh, pumps the, 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 the fluids inside, uh, they could go backwards to the plant and provoke what it's called the egestion and will be the way that the bacteria is inoculated. In a later work in 2009, Bacchus proposed different waveforms that are related with the inoculation of the bacteria. Uh, she called them X waveforms, and X waveforms represent the inoculation events or it's a, or her, her hypothesis proposed that. Uh, Silella fastidiosa was inoculated during this X waveform, which is divided in different um, waves. Uh, for example, you have these C1 peaks, uh, which represent actually a gestion, and these um, kind of uh, spikelet bursts, which were defined, which could represent the valve flattering, which would be the, the, the reason why. Uh, the, the, the fluids in some cases could go uh, backwards to the plant and, um, and um, force the fluids to, 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 to get back into the plant and uh, in this way the, the bacteria will be detached from the presivarium and inoculated into a healthy plant. So these basically are the different waveforms related with the inoculation as she proposed. Although there is no experimental data to show that this is, in fact, the waveform related with inoculation because no transmission experiments were done in association with these EPG signals. So, but keep in mind that there are spikelet bursts, which, because which will, we will go again with uh, this, talking about these spikelet bursts. And also keep in mind that there is also salivation here, which is this waveform, flat waveform here which is also defined or was defined by uh, Bacchus in 2009. So it's interesting to note that the, it's independently if you use a DC or an AC system, you are able to see the same, uh, basically the same waveforms, which may have a different shape, but they resemble very much one to another. For example, this is a <coughs> DC recording of um, an aphid on wheat plants which shows what we define potential drops, and in this case are called flowing potential drops, because they occur, we know now that they occur in the flowing, just before the E1 phase. So these potential drops, which are in the flowing, were already defined in the 1986 by Scheller and Schuckel, and using a AC system, you will see that, that these waveforms have a, an X waveform. It's, it has an X shape, and also defined were also defined as a, an X waveform. So as you can see, the same waveforms can be recorded using a DC or an AC system, and this also represented the flowing contact or the first flowing contact. So uh, here you have. Um, a specific subfaces where the potential drop and intracellular puncture of, of a cell can be divided. This is the 2 1, 2 2, and 2 3 phase. And the 2 1 phase, we know now, well, we know since many years ago that it's related with the <coughs> salivation and inoculation of non persistent viruses. This subface 2 3 is related with the 
acquisition of non-persistent viruses, but we didn't understand what was the two to subphase, which is just in between the, those two phases. So now <coughs> we could uh, go a little bit deeper and try to understand what are these uh, peaks which were proposed uh, as the Egestion peaks from the X waveform. more okay so i will go to the next um, in this uh, slide i would wanted to propose another hypothesis that could happen that while you see these peaks in this uh, waveform uh, which is the x waveform related with the inoculation with of of Sierra fastidiosa by sharpshooters uh, you see these peaks which could resemble very much these are the peaks which are produced by an aphid. Aphids <laughs> were proposed uh, long ago that they could also adjust. Well, sometimes you can get this same uh, waveform during the 2 2 subphase. In this case, it's a recent uh, recording made by Macrocyphonophobia and tomato plants. And you can see exactly or very similar peaks as the ones defined for uh, sharpshooters and uh, during the X wave form of sharpshooters. So, X wave forms which are similar or probably equivalent to the potential drops, sometimes for aphids you can see also these peaks which were associated to adjusted mechanisms. So, this could also resemble, as uh, proposed by Bacchus, that aphids could also sometimes adjust fluids if these peaks really mean adjusted. So this is very unfrequent. This doesn't happen uh, very often on aphids, but we can have some potential drops, which are also uh, very similar to what you can see for sharpshoot. Okay, so now let's move to <coughs> spittlebugs. Philenus spumarius, we defined the different waveforms. EPG waveforms were characterized a mm, couple of years ago. Uh, and we, well, it was in 2018, actually, when we published this work. And the, the work uh, defined basically the different waveforms related to the feeding behavior of sharpshooters. Um, basically, we did some experiments to understand how the sharpshooters were able to acquire the bacteria. Sorry, how hospital bus could acquire the bacteria and how they could inoculate by doing some artificial interruption of the, of the waveforms that I just described before, you could associate a specific waveform with an inoculation or acquisition event. So by doing this, one could understand which specific waveform is related with inoculation. And actually, we suspected after our work that a waveform <coughs> very similar to the X waveform that was defined by Bacchus, uh, using the DC system that can also be recognized uh, as the probably the inoculation waveform. In this case, this has been associated to actually transmission of Silella fastidiosa by Philenus espumarius. So basically, these spikelet bars that we can record using our DC system is associated, in fact, with the inoculation of Silella fastidiosa. And this happened to be a very uh, and frequently, and it's a, a waveform that happens very not very often. And in this first study, we were all, only able to associate the transmission in few cases because the transmission rate we got was very low, only three cases out of five. So now there are um, more data coming out from the laboratory of Rodrigo Almeida and work done by Cornada. Uh, Daniel Cornara in the last two years uh, showed that also XE is related with the inoculation events by Graphocephala atropuntata. And this was uh, done recently, and as you can see, the transmission rate is now much higher, and there are more cases where you can associate the presence of XE with the inoculation of, of the bacteria. So actually, now we know which is the waveform related with the inoculation of the bacteria. And this work uh, shows basically that when you have this pattern, MP, C, XC, XI, XC, you get the highest transmission. And when you don't have XC, basically you don't get transmission. So basically, uh, this waveform seems to be the one related with the transmission. 
I'm not sure how I am on time. We are a little bit late, or or is it too okay. far? Yes, you have. If you want, like two or three minutes more. Okay. Okay. So, in, just to end up my talk, um, I would last just wanted to show a couple of examples on how Silella uh, could affect the behavior of uh, their of its vectors. In this example, this is for citrus variegated uh, chlorosis in Brazil. We studied also the feeding behavior of, of this sharpshooter. And what we could see is that the <coughs> behavior of this sharpshooter and infected plants with clear CDC symptoms um, show that the insect is uh, very uncomfortable and cannot ingest well from the silent. So this is XI. Uh, the presence of XI, and as you can see, when there is a healthy or an infected plant with no symptoms, the insect feeds okay, feeds well, but when the plant is infected, there is almost no feeding. So it means that the insects reject the plants that show CDC symptoms. And the same happened with uh, Philenus espumarius. So um, just to be brief, I would like to say that when the insect feeds, when an infected insect feeds, on, on a plant uh, infected with uh, the bacteria, mm, it has some difficulties. In this case, what we did was to compare the feeding behavior of infected phylenos versus non-infected phylenos. And we found out that the ones that were infected with the bacteria had <coughs> more difficulties to feed on olives than the ones that were non-infected with the bacteria. So plant, the, the insects uh, that are infected with the bacteria don't feed as well as the ones that are not. So it would be nice to know if the insects that produce uh, XA waveforms at a higher frequency when they are infected the bacteria. So perhaps when they are infected the bacteria, we will be able to see more this pattern that is related with the inoculation. So with this question, I would like to finish my talk and just to acknowledge uh, the um, the projects, the funding agencies that were able to perform to, to fund our work, mainly X Factors, which is a European uh, project that we just finished working, and the Marie Curie Actions, which is the work uh, that I described on the mechanism of transmission of Silella by Philenus Espumarius. And of course, my team at the ICA CSIC, which are supporting and helping, helping with all this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto, for your interesting talk. We're going to now move to the second talk of the, of the day, and it's uh, regarding diversity of insect vectors. This uh, talk will be held by, by Barbara De Fea from Museo de la Plata, Argentina. Dr. De Fea is a biologist, so zoology by the Universidad Nacional de la Plata, with a doctoral degree in natural science by the same university. Currently, she's a professor at Universidad Nacional de La Plata, an assistant researcher of the Commission of Scientific Research of the province of Buenos Aires. She's an expert on taxonomy, biology, ecology, and control of leafhoppers, Emiptera cicadelia, cicadelia, cicadelinae, vectors of Silella. Welcome, Barbara, and the floor is yours. Bueno, me, muchas gracias, Carlos, por la presentación. Eh, antes que nada quisiera eh, agradecer ¿sí? la, la invitación, quisiera agradecer a los, a los organizadores y también a, a la red por permitirme estar al, aquí junto a especialistas tan importantes en este tema. Bueno, mi, mi tema, como mi presentación, como ya saben, hoy vamos a hablar de vectores. Acá, a ver, nueva presentación. Bueno, antes de empezar, eh, a mí me toca hablar sobre la diversidad de los vectores, ¿no? Perdón. Eh, mi charla se titula Diversidad de Vectores. Eh, me gustaría, eh, como ya sabemos, ¿no? Todos los vectores eh, no son simplemente organismos que eh, se encargan de pasar el patógeno de una planta infectada a una sana, sino que ahí existe una interacción y una relación un poco más compleja, bastante interesante, en la que los vectores ponen en juego eh, un montón de atributos eh, biológicos y ecológicos 
que más allá de tener, obviamente, implicancias en la dispersión de la bacteria, también lo tienen, en, eh, eh, tienen implicancias en lo que es la ecología y el patrón evolutivo de, la, de, de los patógenos que transmiten. Eh, en el caso de silera fastidiosa, ¿sí? Vamos, ay. en el caso de silera fastidiosa sabemos muy bien eh, que coexiste al mismo tiempo en eh, dos tipos de hospedadores eh, bien diferentes. Uno de ellos son los, los vectores en el en la parte anterior del tubo digestivo este, de los vectores, específicamente en el presivario, y también en el silema de las plantas. Entonces, yo diría que la alimentación, ¡ay oh, Dios! A partir de este, el, la alimentación, a partir del silema, en teoría, ¿no? debería ser un prerequisito para poder transmitir eh, silera fastidiosa. Hasta el momento, ¿sí? todos los vectores eh, confirmados o comprobados de silera fastidiosa pertenecen al orden hemíptera y de estos específicamente al suborden auquenorrinca. Este suborden está subdividido, incluye principalmente insectos fitófagos, acá se puede ver perfectamente, este, que eh, incluye solamente, no solamente sus miembros pueden alimentarse del silema, sino que de hecho la mayoría no lo hace, este, lo hace desde fluidos floemáticos o del mesófilo, y solo algunos, eh, en el caso de, eh, han retenido o mantienen la capacidad de alimentarse a partir del silema. Este suborden está dividido principalmente en dos eh, linajes, que son los cicadomorfa y los fulgoromorfa. En el caso de los cicadomorfa tenemos tres superfamilias, ¿sí? los membracoidea, los cercopoidea y los cicadoidea, de los cuales las cícadas y los este, cercopoidios, todos sus integrantes este, se alimentan preferentemente a partir del silema, mientras que en el caso de los membracoidea, solo una subfamilia de, los cica, de, de una de sus familias de los membracoidios, este, la subfamilia cicadeline, es capaz o retuvo esa condición ¿no? de alimentarse a partir del silema. Aunque no rinca también, no solo, eh, es, o sea, es interesante de ver la cantidad de, en cuanto al número de vectores que incluye, ¿sí? Eh, como vemos acá, ¿sí? No solo incluye vectores de bacterias, sino que también una gran cantidad de, eh, este, eh, de eh, pueden transmitir también otros patógenos como son los virus, espiroplasmas y fitoplasmas. Con respecto a estos tres eh, grupos, ¿sí? siempre refiriéndonos a los alimentadores de silema, podemos ver acá, a simple vista puse esta filmina como para que veamos la cantidad de especies. ¿sí? Todos son grupos con gran cantidad de especies, 2.600 especies en los arcopoidia. Este, todos tienen eh, familias este, o, o miembros representados a nivel mundial, están presentes en todo el mundo, por ejemplo, en el caso de los eh, cercopoidia, los afroforios y los cercópides son cosmopolitas, las cicadoidas son cosmopolitas también. En el caso de los cicadelini, de los cicadeline tenemos este, dos tribus, ¿sí? este, una de ellas es, como, es cosmopolita y la otra está restringida a América. En el caso de los cercopoidia vamos a ver que son eh, insectos desde muy pequeño tamaño a mediano, ¿sí? como por ejemplo el menor tamaño que tienen los clastoptéridos, hasta los este, afroforidos, que llegan a tener este, tamaños interesantes. Este grupo se puede mm, diferenciar del resto, eh, es fácilmente reconocible porque presentan eh, lo que es este, dos espinas bien desarrolladas, laterales, en las tibias posteriores. En el caso de los cicadoides, bueno, también ya son insectos mucho más grandes, de medianos a grandes, y son fácilmente reconocibles porque, bueno, tienen este, en la cabeza, ¿sí? Tres ocelos formando un triángulo entre medio de los ojos compuestos. Y en el caso de los cicadeline, bueno, vamos a ver que tienen, eh, son de, 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 desde un tamaño pequeño a mediano, eh, como miembros de los este, membracoidios, bueno, eh, hay, producen brocosomas, que son partículas, este, nanopartículas microproteicas que excretan y esparcen a lo largo de, tu, de, de todo su cuerpo. 
en el, en el caso de los, este, y como parte de, los, de la familia cicadélide, es característica la, la presencia de cuatro hileras de, de macrocetas en, la tibia, en las tibias posteriores. Y en cuanto a cicadeline, uno puede reconocerlos a partir de eh, características en la cabeza y en las alas principalmente. Algo interesante de ver, ¿no? este, y que puede tener implicancia en lo que es el manejo de estas, en, de, de estos, en el control de estos vectores, de los vectores que pertenecen a estos grupos, son los ciclos biológicos. ¿sí? Estos tres grupos presentan ciclos bastante diferentes. Tienen, por ejemplo, en el caso de los cercopoidea, vamos a ver que si bien todos son hemimotábolos y pasan por al menos cinco este, estadios ninfales, en el caso de, la, de los cercopoidia, vamos a ver que las ninfas tienen una movilidad reducida, se encuentran, eh, se desarrollan en un ambiente semiacuático, en una masa de espuma, que todos conocemos bien, ya son estas que se ven acá. Este, allí este, permanecen hasta, eh, la, hasta la etapa adulta, hasta que emerge, y eh, en el caso de los cercopoides, lo que pasa es que las, eh, las, la primera generación que emerge lo que hace es migrar hacia la vegetación para oviponer, pueden pasar hasta tres, este, pueden tener hasta tres generaciones por, por año eh, y en el caso de estos, al parecer no, la, la ninfa al tener una, una movilidad tan reducida no, es, no tendría una implicancia en lo que es la transmisión de la bacteria. En el caso de los cicadoidea, vamos a ver que, bueno, las cícadas oviponen en lo que es la, la parte más leñosa de la vegetación. Hay algunas que lo hacen que no, pero la mayoría sí. Vamos a ver que los huevos, las, este, las ninfas cuando emergen caen al suelo y es bien característico el ciclo porque ellas lo que hacen es, eh, con sus patas fosoras, cavan en el suelo, forman galerías y este, forman una especie de madriguera a partir en donde se van a alimentar del de silema de las raíces. Tienen un desarrollo bastante lento, pueden tardar hasta años en llegar al estado adulto y este, también por su modo de vida tampoco estarían implicadas en lo que es la transmisión de la bacteria. Y en el caso de los cicadeline cambia bastante la cosa porque bueno, en este caso vamos a ver que las ninfas son bien activas, eh, comparten no solo el recurso con los adultos, sino también el ambiente y son capaces de adquirir la bacteria este, y pierden es, la capacidad de transmitirla una vez que mudan, ¿no? El próximo estadio tiene que volver a adquirirla para poder volver a transmitirla y así sucesivamente. Eh, a ver, si bien todas estas son características que diferencian a estos tres grupos, también... El hecho de alimentarse a partir del de silema, del fluido silemático, ¿no? este, que es un recurso tan, eh, es, es tan este, pobre nutritivamente, sobre todo en lo que es carbono orgánico y nitrógeno, hace que estos eh, organismos hayan tenido que adoptar algunas estrategias fisiológicas y comportamentales que tienen implicancias también en lo anatómico, como por ejemplo, ¿no? el desarrollo de, el gran desarrollo que uno, los, que uno les ve externamente, que es eh, el, el clipio o el frontoclipio este, in, bien hinchado, ¿sí? en donde se aloja una bomba este, sibarial asistida por, por musculatura muy potente, lo que a su vez esto le permite tener un altos grados de consumo, ¿sí? como exhiben estos, estos insectos tienden a ser este, extremadamente polífagos. Hay especies monófagas, pero la mayoría de ellos eh, son polífagos, alimentándose de, de vegetales con distinto perfil químico. Algo interesante también a nivel comportamental es que a, a, este, como ajustaron todo lo que es el, el, las tasas de consumo a las fluctuaciones este, diarias de las concentraciones de aminoácidos en el silema, también algo raro dentro de los animales eh, terrestres, ¿no? Es la excreción eh, de amonio. Y también una adaptación en el, en, en el tubo digestivo que les permite eh, excretar de manera rápida el exceso de agua que ingresa mientras se alimentan. Bueno, ya 
teniendo eh, en cuanto a los vectores en, a nivel mundial, vamos a ver de estos tres grupos, siempre de estos alimentadores de silema y de estos tres grupos, yo voy a hablar sobre la situación en estas tres regiones, ¿sí? Me voy a centrar en ellas. Bueno, en Europa, como ya sabemos, el establecimiento de Silela, ¿sí? En 2013, reportado en 2013, este, afectando olivos en el sur de Italia. Bueno, obviamente, eh, a partir de eso se iniciaron un montón de... de, de se iniciaron este, investigaciones que permitieron, ¿sí? Obtener información respecto de eh, los potenciales vectores. Eh, considerando... Lo que vemos acá, ¿sí? y todos los estudios realizados hasta el momento, ¿sí? los ICA del INE, por ejemplo, eh, no cumplirían un rol, son, son más bien escasos. De hecho, eh, hay muy pocas especies representadas en, el, en, en Europa y los que están presentes tienen una distribución bastante limitada. Pero, a diferencia, eh, las cícadas y los cicadoideos y los cercopoideos, ¿sí? que hasta ahora habían sido bastante, o tenían un rol no, eh, marginal en lo que era la epidemiología de, de la bacteria, eh, en esta región parecen cumplir un rol bastante clave. En Europa, bueno, hasta el momento, desde ese momento hasta ahora, se han registrado un montón de especies, de los, de, principalmente de cicadoidea, como vemos acá, este, aproximadamente 40, de los orcopoidea unas 30 especies. En el caso de las cícadas, este, no, este, hay una gran representación de especies, pero su, su rol en la transmisión no está o sea, no, 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 es, no está todavía comprobada, y lo que sí sabemos es que muchas pueden ser portadoras. Ahora, eh, en ninguna todavía se ha corroborado lo que es la transmisión. Con respecto a los arcopoya, también hay una gran cantidad de especies asociadas a los cultivos afectados. Vamos a ver que en este caso sí, ya tenemos vectores comprobados, ¿sí?, son estos que vemos acá, son afrofóridos de los géneros filenus este, y neofilenus, que son bien conocidos seguramente por todos los que estamos acá. En el caso de los cercópidos, vamos a ver que tenemos solo tres especies representadas, acá yo pues solamente puse dos, y vamos a ver que en el caso de los cicadelinos, solamente hay dos especies registradas, que son cicadela viridis y grafocefala fenal. Por lo cual se cree que no este, estarían interviniendo en la dispersión de la bacteria. Sí, en este caso creo que el vector clave es eh, considerado Filenus espumarius, ¿sí? es una especie extremadamente polífaga que está ampliamente distribuida en todo el continente este, y al parecer bueno, sería el vector clave para esta región. En lo que corresponde ya a América y específicamente a Norteamérica. Vamos a ver que hay, eh, bueno, Silela está presente en México, en la mayor parte de Estados Unidos y en Canadá. Eh, de hecho, la mayor parte de la información con la cual contamos de Silela fastidiosa y de sus vectores, tanto de su eficiencia de transmisión como de su biología, proviene ¿sí? de, de Estados Unidos y principalmente del de patosistema de Pierce de la Vid en, en California. Eh, como vemos acá, como, está mostrado, como les muestro acá, en este caso los principales vectores de Silela fastidiosa pertenecen ¿sí? a la subfamilia Cicadeline. Y en segundo lugar y tercer lugar quedarían los, los este, afroforidos y los cicadios. Hasta el momento, aproximadamente unas 60 especies están asociadas, ¿sí? a, a, de alimentadores de silema, asociados a los cultivos afectados, de los cuales 34 son vectores comprobados. Pero algo también interesante de ver es que no todos, de, de, eh, no todos ellos están asociados a este, la epidemiología de las distintas enfermedades. Los vectores más importantes, en este caso, bueno, acá están los vectores más importantes para... Estados Unidos, ¿no? Eh, vemos acá Omalodisca vitripenis, que es el vector, creo que, clave 
¿no? Es una especie que, si bien tiene una baja eficiencia de transmisión, tiene atributos que compensan esa baja eficiencia, como por ejemplo es una especie que este, es extremadamente polífaga, mmm, llega a tener, eh, a, a tener a grandes densidades en los hábitats de preferencia, también este, es, eh, tiene un, un rango amplio de distribución, por lo cual, bueno, se la considera que es eh, el vector clave, ¿sí? sobre todo en, en lo que es vivo. Y después, en segundo lugar, podemos decir que ah, podemos, podríamos eh, considerar la fosefala tropuntata, después otras especies que también son muy abundantes en lo que son las malezas asociadas a determinados cultivos y que intervienen en la dispersión primaria eh, de la bacteria. Así que en el caso de Omalodisca también es interesante ver que no solo está, este, interviene en la, en la infección primaria, sino también en la secundaria. Bueno, estos son un poco los más importantes en Estados Unidos. Ahora, cuando hablamos de Sudamérica, bueno, en Sudamérica Silela está presente en lo que es eh, Venezuela, gran parte de Brasil, en Paraguay y en Argentina. En este caso vamos a ver que todas, eh, hay, eh, la, los primeros reportes de Silela eh, fueron afectando ¿sí? este, plantaciones de ciruelo, después eso se reportó también en Paraguay y en Brasil, pero Silela fastidiosa no tomó notoriedad hasta que se comprobó que era la gente causal de la clorosis variegada de los cítricos eh, en Brasil, ¿no? Vamos a ver acá que eh, afecta a distintos eh, cultivos, como puede ser eh, la, la que es ciruelos, eh, cítricos, también afecta, eh, buscando hospedadores alternativos, se encontró que también afectaba al café, bueno, almendros, y recientemente fue detectada en olivos, tanto en Brasil como en Argentina. Con respecto a, la, a los vectores en esta, en esta región, lo que vamos a ver es que la mayoría de los alimentadores de silema, o la, eh, que vamos a encontrar asociados tanto a cítricos principalmente y olivos, pertenecen también este, a la subfamilia cicadeline y en segundo lugar estarían los cercopoides. Se registra una alta riqueza específica de cicadelinos en todos estos agroecosistemas afectados. Y eh, hay algo, sucede algo claro, que es que tenemos especies, tanto en Argentina como en Brasil, sucede que tenemos un grupo de especies este, bien identificado para, eh, y presente en lo que son los cítricos o los olivos, y después especies que se encuentran este, claramente asociadas a lo que es la vegetación del suelo, la vegetación circundante a estos cultivos. Algo muy rápido para decir respecto de la clorosis variegada, tan en, en la principal este, zona citrícola de Brasil, en, en el estado de San Paulo, se registraron este, aproximadamente 29 géneros ¿sí? de alimentadores de silema, 26 de ellos son cicadelinos y 4 sarcopoideos, eh, 13 ¿sí? son vectores comprobados a los cítricos, aunque se registraron eficiencias bastante bajas. En el caso de Argentina vamos a ver que la, eh, la producción citrícola está este, distribuida en dos grandes zonas, una en el, en, el noroeste, en el noreste, en donde sí se registra la enfermedad, está la enfermedad presente a lo largo de toda el área, y en el caso de la, en la zona del noroeste, en donde eh, no está presente. Si hablamos de las especies asociadas a, estos a, a los cultivos afectados, más o menos contamos con alrededor de 53 especies asociadas. La mayoría de ellos, como ven acá, son cicadelinos y solamente 8 cercopoidios. En Argentina no contamos con vectores comprobados, ¿sí? solo tenemos eh, detección positiva para nueve especies ¿sí? relacionadas a los cultivos y solamente se, llevó a, se llevaron adelante ensayos preliminares de dos especies, ¿sí? que este, en esos ensayos se logró la transmisión de silenas fastidios. Acá están los vectores comprobados para Brasil, muchos de ellos también están presentes en Argentina. 
vamos a ver que algunos de ellos están principalmente asociados como pilobopterus o malodisca ignorata, un cometopia facial y citrina citrina, están este, o biponen y se alimentan, utilizan este, a los cítricos este, como hospederos de oviposición y de alimentación. Bucefalogonia santophis, si bien también hace lo mismo, también es muy, este, es frecuente encontrarla en, en la vegetación asociada a los cultivos. Y después tenemos este, especies que están más asociadas a la vegetación circundante, pero que también son vectores comprobados. En cuanto, eh, bueno, en Argentina, en cuanto a las especies predominantes, vamos a ver que tenemos este, especies más o menos similares en ambas zonas, ¿sí? Pero puede, acá también se ve una clara diferencia entre, entre lo que son las especies que están asociadas a los cítricos y las especies que se encuentran en la vegetación asociada. En lo que respecta a los vectores clave, ¿sí? todos, estos, eh, todos estos vectores de los cuales eh, están presentes en Brasil o fueron comprados en Brasil, también son predominantes en, en los cultivos. De, se los encuentra de manera predominante. Pero este, estos cuatro son los que se consideran como los vectores clave en Brasil. Y en Argentina, solamente teniendo en cuenta... Eh, la densidad que llegan a tener estas dos especies, junto con los antecedentes este, este, de detección positiva de la bacteria, bueno, podríamos decir que esto podrían estar, a llegar a estar involucrados en la transmisión. Bueno, por último, eh, en los olivos, bueno, sabemos que en, en Argentina fue detectado, fueron detect, Silera fastidiosa fue detectada en la principal eh, área olivícola, ¿sí? afectando a olivos de la variedad de Arauco. Allí, eh, a partir de esta detección, ¿sí? se llevaron adelante muestreos, eh, trabajos de campo, en donde logramos este, registrar nueve especies de alimentadores de silema, principalmente de la subfamilia Cicadeline, y solo un cercópido, ¿sí? que estuvo eh, asociado más que nada a la vegetación asociada y en muy baja densidad, con tres especies predominantes de cicadeline y tres especies positivas para silela. ¿sí? En el caso de Brasil, fue reportado eh, eh, silela afectando a Rios recién en 2016, un año después, en la región de Sao Paulo y Minas Gerais, ellos, en este caso en Brasil, están, eh, se registraron 106 especies, una gran cantidad de especies, la mayor parte eh, pertenecientes a la subfamilia Cicadeline, eh, pero también hay clastopteridos, cercópidos y afrofóridos, ¿sí? con 18 especies predominantes y 11, en realidad 14, ¿no? de ellas eh, fueron comprobados como vectores de silela a los olivos. Acá se las presento. En Argentina, estas tres son especies predominantes en los olivos. Eh, esta es el único cercópido, Natosulia entrerriana, eh, que fue eh, recolectado en baja densidad y siempre asociado a la vegetación espontánea. Y en el caso de Brasil, tres especies de todas las eh, registradas serían las que están involucradas en la dispersión, ¿no? una especie de clastoptera, y dos cicadelinos, que son Escopogonalia paula y Macogonalia cadifrons. Bueno, hasta acá llegamos. Eh, antes de terminar, me gustaría presentarles a todo lo, a, a, al equipo de trabajo, al grupo de trabajo al que pertenezco. Eh, es el laboratorio de Auquenorrincos, eh, del Museo de la Plata, eh, Está liderado por la doctora Ana Marino, que trabaja en taxonomía y biología de Eukenorrinca, específicamente en fulgoromorfa. Y también desarrollamos otras líneas de investigación, más que nada relacionadas a lo que es taxonomía y biología de cicadélidos, también de cercópidos. Y en cuanto a, también tenemos líneas de investigación respecto de eh, comportamiento en alimentación y endosimbiontes. Y también en este control biológico, con, a partir de entomopatógenos y de parasitoides. Antes de terminar, igual me gustaría nombrar a este otro grupo de trabajo, que actualmente es con el que más estamos interactuando, que es eh, 
con ellos llevamos adelante toda la parte del de trabajo en olivos. Está conformado no solo por nosotros y por fitopatólogos, sino que también por eh, productores que nos permiten trabajar en las, en las fincas, por también este, las personas técnicas, los técnicos que nos permiten llevar adelante los muestreos y por ingenieros eh, agrónomos que nos asisten también. Bueno, ahora sí, muchas gracias. Thank you, Barbara, for your talk. Eh, moving on with the third uh, talk of this uh, second session, uh, that it's about vector population dynamics, the case of Eastern Spain. The speaker for this talk is Francisco Beita from Ibia, Spain. Dr. Francisco Beita is uh, graduated in biology of the University of Valencia. He has a PhD in biology at the University of Valencia, postdoctoral with horticultural crop pest and their biological but biological control, especially with agromycid dipterans and their imenopteran parasitoids, and secondary effect of pesticides on natural enemies at the station de Zoologie de Dut Biologique of INRA in Antibes, France. Currently, he's a research professor in Instituto Nacional de Investigación y Tecnología Agraria y Alimentaria in Madrid. He's an expert on citrus pests and their bi biological control, focusing main, mainly on the tephritis, especially ceratitis capitata and its imenoptidan parasitoids, but also on white flies and other pests in, culture, in horticultural crops. Recently, he has joined a national multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary group that is investigating the problems caused by the introduction of Xylella fastidiosa in Spain, and in particular, all issues related to their in insect vectors. Welcome, Francisco, and the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you for introducing me, Carlos, and good evening to, or good morning, depending on the continent. Okay, so I, I was, I, I, I'm talking about the vector population dynamics in the in Spain, but especially in the in the eastern Spain. And next, please. Uh, and uh, uh, you have seen this slide more or less bef uh, before in the talk of. Uh, Alberto Ferreres, but this first slide, slide is just to, to, to say that the, the potential vector of Silela uh, belongs to the infraorder Cicadomorpha, and in this infraorder you have three superfamily and several, many, many species. But next, the importance of this uh, situation is that in the Americas, the more important vectors of Silela fastidiosa are the including in the Cicadelli family the, and the subfamily Cicadellinae, as is the case of the vectors that are uh, transmitting the peace disease in grape wine in California, for example, or also the citrus variegated chlorosis in citrus in Brazil. But next, please. When the Silella fastidiosa arrived into Europe and was detected for the first time in, two, in 2013, the EFSA, European Food Safety Authority, has done a study to know, based on the level of polyphagy, abundance and adaptation to environmental conditions and many other factors, how could be the main important species to be vectors of the bacteria. And it's curious that only the species signaled with a with a star, Cicadella viridis, belongs to this Cicadellini subfamily. The other belongs to other groups. So that uh, gives us the idea that uh, in Europe, the potential vectors of the bacteria must be different completely to the main vectors of the bacteria in America. Next, please. Uh, mainly because the subfamily Cicadellini, as uh, Barbara has talked to us, some minutes ago, are not as abundant as in America. And so far, now in, in Europe, only three species have been confirmed as vectors of Silella fastidiosa and belong to one family, the family Afrophoridae. And they are Philenus espumarius, Neophilenus campestis, and Neophilenus italosicus. The, they are uh, vectors of the bacteria because uh, experiments of transmission, as uh, Alberto Ferrer has told, has been done and has confirmed this uh, particularity. 
because uh, the other species has been detected the bacteria in into the into the insects into the specimens but uh, not uh, uh, the experiments uh, of transmission has not been done on or uh, they have not uh, good uh, positive results next please so this all previous result has been confirmed we can say when in italy in in 2015 has been detected the bacteria producing the oliquid decline and in the region of apulia and the, the italian colleagues has attributed the spread of the disease to one insect philenus spumarius and this insect has uh, some interesting characteristics first, first of all it has only one generation per year uh, with uh, the development of the eggs, five nymphal stages, and the adult, and a uh, host range mainly uh, on herbaceous plants. Next, please. And this is important because this is the dynamics of Philenus spumarius in olive crops in the Puglia region, uh, prepared by the, the Italian colleagues. And uh, if we begin in the in the in the slide in, in the bottom left. In, when it put autumn winter in this period in autumn winter the the adults uh, the female put eggs on the herbaceous plants that are in the in the olive groves in these herbaceous plants in late winter spring early spring they appear this foam characteristic of the afrophoridae this foam or spittle that uh, announce the presence of nymphs and the nymphs uh, remains in the herbaceous plants uh, until the 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 the, the, the development uh, to adults, and in late spring, early summer, the, the first adults remain in these herbaceous plants. But when it's summer, the the, the plants of the cover and the surroundings of the grove uh, dry out. Then they move to the to the to the trees, and it's the moment when the adults are able to take to acquire the bacteria from the from the trees and infect and transmit the bacteria to health health plants okay next please so in spain uh, uh, the bacteria is present now in two places in the balearic island where it was detected in 2016 on and it's present in many different host plants crops and weeds and several plants and in the Valencian community, where it was detected in 2017, one year later than in the Balearic Islands, and uh, as crop is uh, almost exclusively on almond trees, on almond crops, but it's present in many other in many other plants. So next, please. So in the last four years, two national projects are mainly studying the vectors of Silea fastidios in Spain. Uh, with the participation of many Spanish groups and also abroad groups, and in the in the in the picture of the of the left, you can see my group surrounded by the orange circle is the IBIA. So we are working in in this in, in this project. But the two projects that are working studying the evolution of the of the vectors of Silla fastidiosa. Next. So to, to give you an idea about the, the species and the situation evolution of this species in the Mediterranean area, it's important to, to, to say that uh, from the data from the Plant Health Service in the Balearic Island, uh, it has been found that there are three main potential species of uh, the bacteria that are Philanus spumarius, Neophilenus campestris, and Neophilenus lineatus with uh, Neophilenus spumarius be the, the, the more abundant species, clearly. Next, please. In the case of the, of the Valencian community, we have two zones to differentiate. Uh, in the south, we have the name of the marketed zone where the bacteria is present in the province of Alicante, and is where uh, the bacteria is present mainly on almond trees. And to the north of this demarcate zone is the, the area where my group is working to, not, to analyze the evolution of uh, vectors of Silella fastidiosa, but without the presence of the bacteria. And we have uh, studied the evolution of these potential vectors on citrus, on olive, and, and almond crops. Next, please. Regarding the results of the, of the potential vectors or vectors 
in the, the marketed area, uh, four species have been found, Neophilianus campestris, Philanus spumarius, and Neophilianus lineatus. It means the same than in Balearic Islands. Also, another one species, Thercopis intermedia, not belonging to the Afrophoridae, but to the Thercopidae family. But in this case, in the in the demarcated zone in the Valencia community, the two predominant species, more or less at the same level, are Neophilianus campestris and Philanus spumarius. And next, please. And according to our work, in, the, in this zone to the north, to this demarcated area, we have found five potential vectors of uh, Silera fastidiosa, Philanus spumarius, Neophilianus lineatus, Neophilianus campestris, and the same Thercopis intermedia that has been found in the demarcated zone, but another one species, Lepilonia coleoptata. But according to our results, the results of the group in the Balearic Islands and the results of many other groups in Spain, in Catalonia, in Aragon, in the center of Spain, Madrid, and also in Andalusia, the two main species that can be vectors of the bacteria, and that in fact are two of the species that are recognized as transmitters, transmitters of the, the bacteria, are Philanus spumarius and Neophilanus campestris. And for that, all the study we have done is focusing on these two species. Next. And now I will present you some data about the, the dynamics of these two species in different regions. In the left, you can see the annual evolution of nymphs. First, we, we are talking about nymphs. Of nymphs in olive groves in our study uh, in Valencia community in the north of the Marcate zone. And you can see that the two species in, in orange is Philanus and in blue, Neophilanus. The nymphs appear more or less in late February, uh, beginning of March, depending on the climatology of uh, the year. They have a peak in the middle spring. And finally, the, the nymphs began to disappear until the June, more or less, until the, the month of, of June. And here you have another example to the right is the, the same, the abundance and seasonal pattern of nymphs, but in Mallorca, in the isla of Mallorca, uh, it's a resume of, of the, the data from three years, and you have the same. The beginning of the appearance of nymphs in more or less in March, a peak in the middle of spring, and after that they disappear progressively until the, the beginning of, uh, of the summer. In this case, for example, of uh, Mallorca, the, it's more abundant, the population of Philanus spumarius in blue, than in the case of of uh, Valencian community that is more abundant, not, not so than in Mallorca. But this is clear for us until now that the uh, evolution of the nymphs in these two species is similar. Uh, the, at, the, at the end of, the, of uh, the winter, they began to appear and they, they have a peak in the spring and they disappear more or less at the, at the end of the spring, beginning of summer. Please, the next. And in the case of adults, and in the left, in the left view, we have the annual evolution in, uh, in olive groves in our work, the work done by Ivia. You can see that uh, in blue is uh, Philanus spum, uh, per, sorry, in orange is Philanus spumarius, and in gray is, uh, in, in, sorry, in orange is Neophilanus campestris, and in gray is Philanus spumarius. You can see that, that the two species have more or less the same pattern of evolution, a peak of adults in uh, spring and another peak in autumn. But the difference is that uh, Neophilianus campestris disappear in summer in the groves, but, but Philanus spumarius, it remains in the groves in summer. And if we compare our results with the results uh, in uh, almond groves in the demarcate zone, to, in the graph to the right, in yellow you have uh, Philanus spumarius, and in red Neophilanus campestris. You can see that's it, that's it the same. Uh, Neophilanus campestris is present in the spring, disappear completely in summer, and in appear again uh, at the end of the spring. And Philanus spumarius is present all the year, including the summer time. Well, an, an explanation of this situation. We can, we can have this explanation in the next slide. Here we, we take results of the group of the Balearic Island, and you have here the 
seasonal, seasonal pattern and abundance of adults of uh, Neophyllenus campestris in the isle of Mallorca in three years. And you can see that Neophyllenus campestris is the same as I have present to the Valencian community. But here you have another particularity. You have the difference between uh, the presence of adults in the cover, is blue, in the tree, or in the border of the of the of the plot of the grove, and you can see that Neophyllenus campestris in general in the three years is the same, present in spring and in autumn, but absent in summer, and only in the third year in the in 2020 when when it has a presence in summer, we can see that is in the cover. It means that the insect needs a plant that uh, uh, is in good conditions to maintain the populations in, uh, in summer, because normally the plants of the cover of the plot are completely dry out and disappear uh, and, not, and, and uh, are not able to the, the evolution and the, the, the maintaining of the population. Next, please. But if we see the now the evolution, no, no, the previous one, the evolution of Philaenus spumarius is the same that I, we have seen before, two peaks in the spring and in autumn. And uh, this, this species the, don't disappear completely in summer because as you can see, they are present in this, in the gray uh, line that is the cover, uh, sorry, the border. It means that normally uh, the insects uh, go out from the crop uh, searching for a shelter places and when they find some uh, plants in the in the surroundings of the plot they are able to uh, remain there and it's true that in the orange uh, graph we can see that there are a little presence in the tree but possibly is when they are moving from the plants of the cover to the plants of the surrounding they pass for a moment to the trees to arrive to these uh, other plants and next please we can confirm this. These are results uh, of our work in the in olive groves. We have here uh, each three bars uh, belongs to three different uh, plots. But I can uh, pay attention in the bars that are marked with the arrows because in one special uh, plot uh, named Segorbet 2. And you can see that in the case of Neophilenus campestris, these are data from 2021. In the case of Philenus uh, Neophilenus campestris, we have the presence in spring, the presence in autumn, and the absence in summer. And when the adults are present, uh, they are present mainly in orange in the in the cover. Only when the, the only when at the beginning of a spring, when the cover is not completely recuperated, they are in the uh, border. But the presence in the tree is in, in blue is, is insignificant. But to the right, in the case of Philenus spumarius, we can see that it's present all over the year and mainly is present in, uh, on the cover in orange. But when we arrive into the end of spring, we can see that the, the presence in the cover are decreasing and it increased the presence in the border. And also we have some presence is in color blue in the tree. And they pass uh, the adults the summer mainly in the in the border, in the plants of the border. And when in, in the spring the plants of the cover um, grow again, they pass to these plants. And I have selected this uh, plot, Segor so 2. Next, please because it's a it's a case very very curious next slide please next sorry yes here is the this this plot segorbe 2 and uh, to the in the left to the left you have the, the the picture of the edge of the plot the plot is from this edge to the to the right and you have you can see that they are 2 or 3 meters the distance between the plot and a uh, forest, pine forest. And in the picture of the right, you can see all the plants in the in the pine forest that are plants very, very suitable for Philenus spumarius. 
So in this plot, it's clear for us that the adults have been present in the in the cover of the grove. When the, this cover is died out, they have passed, they have moved directly to the to the plants of the of the pine forest that were very near, and they have passed just 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 a moment just to 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 move for, for uh, by the tree it means that the tree is not uh, in this case the only the only trees are not suitable in our in our opinion for uh philanthropus pumarius and philanthropus pumarius prefer herbaceous plants and they are searching for for those plants for that next please the conclusions of all this evolution of the population of uh, of the two main species uh, considered as vectors of Fisilla fastidiosa in Eastern Spain, we can say that there are two species, effectively, Philenus spumarius and Philenus campestris. Both species have a different range of Esbarpus plant, but because it's important to remark that uh, Neophilenus campestris has a clear preference for Coaceas, Coaceae, but no, uh, Philaenus spumaris prefers Asteraceae and Fabaceae, so the, the species that are present in a crop is very, very important as cover plants. It's very, very important to determine the presence or not of one of these species. And they determine, determine also the, the population dynamics. And in summer, with the absence of these opt optimal herbaceous plants in, in the crop plot, the, uh, the adults of the two species uh, must move to shelter areas and pa possibly passing uh, through the woody plants and in that moment is when they can acquire the the bacteria and transmit the bacteria to healthy plants but in our opinion just is in the moment they are moving from one uh, plant to the shelter the shelter plants they they need to pass the summer and uh, adults of both species return to the herbaceous plants of the cover crop in autumn when these herbaceous plants grow up again. For that, as conclusion, we can say that uh, the management of the plant cover in crops susceptible to, to cellular fastidious infection, as well as the potential use of shelter and or trap plants, can be a very effective method for managing population of the two main insect vectors of Cellular fastidiosa in Eastern Spain. This managing of the plants we are using as cover plants or uh, plants in the border could uh, give us a, a, a system to, to, to control the population of the, the two species. Next one. Next, yes. And of course, uh, it's uh, necessary to grateful to the, to the project we, we, my group has been involved in, but also to the, all the people that, that has working in, in this project, that um, not many people are, uh, are staff people, stable people. Much of them are uh, students that have passed three, four months, a student from Spain and student abroad in Spain that have passed three, four months with us, but the, their work has been very, very important to, to, to arrive to, to very, inter are very interesting results. Next. And uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, um, it would be a pleasure to ask him to respond to you. Thank you, Francisco, for your interesting talk. Uh, moving on, before we start with the with the last session, just remember that the list of attendance is a uh, the link is in in the chat of in the YouTube channel, so you can register your your attendance. The last topic of, of this session is about natural enemies and vectors. And the speaker is Eduardo Virla from FML and CONICET, Tucumán, Argentina. Dr. Virla has a bachelor degree in zoology and a PhD in natural science, Universidad de la Plata, and completed a postdoctoral position in, Ita in Italy by the University Degli Studi della Tuzia. His major expertise is on parasitoids that attack Hemiptera and a taxonomy of Trinidae in Hymenoptera from the Neotropical region. He's, he's a full professor at the Fundación Miguel y yo and a CONICET researcher. His scientific contribution is oriented to the biological control of pests 
with focus on bioecological aspects of vector plants, diseases, corn and citrus, and their natural enemies, and on biological control, control of the fall armyworm Spodoptera frugiferna. Uh, welcome, Eduardo, and the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, eh, muchas gracias Carlos, muchas gracias a los eh, organizadores de la reunión eh, por la invitación. Eh, bueno, vamos a tratar eh, un poco de hablar sobre los enemigos naturales de los vectores y de los potenciales vectores. Eh, ya los eh, doctores que me antecedieron eh, explicaron quiénes serán los vectores y potenciales vectores, y bueno, hay que tener en cuenta que, como cualquier especie animal, los vectores eh, se encuentran eh, formando parte de redes tróficas. Estas redes tróficas, en estas redes tróficas siempre hay alguien que es comido, y alguien que come y alguien que es comido eh, por alguien. Eh, bueno, los antagonistas de los auquenorrinca en general se agrupan según sus hábitos en parásitos, patógenos, predadores y, de, y parasitoides. Como saben, en general, no voy a, a, a profundizar en cada una de estas categorías, pero los parásitos están mayormente representados por nematodes, que, cuyas especies son en general bastante especialistas, los patógenos eh, son enfermedades de los insectos, eh, constituidas por hongos, virus, bacterias, eh, que son, tienen una cierta especialización, pero mayormente a través de distintas cepas. Estos dos grupos, parásitos y patógenos, se los puede encontrar en la literatura eh, nombrados como entomopatógenos. En cuanto a los predadores, estos pertenecen a muchos eh, grupos animales, desde mamíferos, anfibios, hasta insectos, arañas, son generalistas, eh, comen a, su, a lo largo de su vida muchas presas, y los parasitoides es el grupo más especializado dentro de los insectos, eh, está constituido por eh, himenópteras, principalmente himenóptera y por díptera, especies de díptera y de himenóptera. Eh, en cuanto a los parásitos que atacan a los vectores o potenciales vectores, eh, los mayores registros se encuentran en aquellas especies que tienen hábitos eh, que favorecen las infecciones. Eh, por ejemplo, en las chicharras que pasan un estado de su vida eh, bajo el suelo, o en los cercópidos o afrofóridos que están, tienen hábitos, sus ninfas principalmente, cercanos al suelo. Eh, en cuanto a los membrácidos y a los cicadélidos, eh, parecería, hay infecciones detectadas, principalmente en cicadelini, eh, pero parecería que esas eh, son mayormente eh, accidentales. Eh, con respecto a los patógenos, eh, yo, hongos, virus y bacterias, caché virus y bacterias, ¿por qué? Porque en la literatura no he encontrado menciones, quién sabe, se me escapó alguna cita bibliográfica, eh, o la he desconocido, pero lo principal que se notan son eh, eh, infecciones causadas por hongos. Estas infecciones en el campo son raras de ver, o sea, son bastante ocasionales, y la mayoría de los papers o de los trabajos que tratan sobre hongos y entomopatógenos en eh, chicharritas vectoras de silela, hablan de eh, ensayos hechos con cepas encontradas en el suelo que se prueban sobre las distintas poblaciones de vectores. Eh, ahí pongo unos cuantos ejemplos. Tengan en cuenta que en los cercópiros y en los afrofóridos, eh, la espuma que recubre a, a, los, a las formas inmaduras tendrían efecto antifúngico, está comprobado para los afrofóridos y también tiene actividad quitinasa, lo que dificulta el crecimiento de los hongos. En cuanto a, a los membrácidos y a los cicadélidos, eh, hay muchas especies de hongos, generalmente son de los mismos géneros, Metarrhizum, Isutela, eh, Pandora pero bueno, en Sudamérica, por ejemplo, se con, eh, perdón, en América, se conocen para homaladisca en Estados Unidos varios géneros que la atacan, y en Sudamérica eh, hemos realizado hace muchos años un trabajo con la doctora Toledo, eh, donde encontramos Clonostatis rosia. En realidad, les voy a mostrar 
la situación, nosotros encontrábamos en el campo a los sharpshooters, a los proponinos, todos cubiertos de hongos, pero tuvimos que comprobar que cronostatis realmente era patógena, haciendo un poco lo que serían para enfermedades los postulados de Koch, digamos, partir de poblaciones sanas, infectarlas con el hongo. Bueno, paso a los depredadores, tengan en cuenta que los depredadores o predadores son generalistas, y por lo tanto cualquier vector o potencial vector de filera es, un poten es una potencial presa. Eh, hay eh, un montón de datos sobre distintos predadores eh, que atacan a vectores o potenciales vectores. En especial quería remarcar en las chicharras, es muy marcado, hay muchos estudios que hablan de una predación diferencial de las aves sobre los machos de las chicharras, porque las aves detectan cuando está el llamado de los machos. Eh, hay un caso también para Homoladisca vitipreni que invadió eh, Asia, unas islas en Asia, donde se descubrió que eh, cuando unas arañas locales comían al proponino, eh, se morían, o sea, había un efecto eh, de intoxicación. Eh, bueno, los grupos que atacan a los proponinos, eh, perdón, a los vectores, son variados, principalmente entre los insectos, eh, hay eh, redúvidos, eh, hay neurópteros, coccinéridos, dermápteros, pero un resumen de, de esto, en este, esta nube de palabras, sería que principalmente eh, los vectores eh, son atacados por otros insectos que son entomófagos, eh, seguidos de arañas, eh, después por eh, aves, mamíferos, eh, bueno, sapos, eh, ranas, lagartijas. Puse la foto de este pájaro que en Sudamérica, bueno, en Argentina llamamos Venteveo, eh, que es un pájaro que está distribuido en casi toda América, porque nosotros eh, tuvimos un, hacíamos muestreos en naranjos en el norte de Argentina, poniendo trampas pegajosas amarillas, y eh, a la semana cuando íbamos a recoger las trampas nos encontrábamos las alas de los proponinos o insectos que estaban, solamente las alas, nos faltaba el insecto. Nos pusimos a estudiar qué, qué era lo que pasaba y era que estos eh, pájaros habían descubierto las trampas y se comían los insectos que se habían pegado, así como hay muchos pájaros que comen los insectos que mueren en los palabrisas de los automóviles. Es solamente para comentarles eh, un caso curioso y que hay que tener en cuenta a veces cuando uno hace muestros en el campo con trampas. Eh, en cuanto a los parasitoides, los parasitoides de los auquenorrincos se pueden dividir en dos gremios, el gremio de los parasitoides de, de huevos y los que atacan a las ninfas y a los adultos. Eh, aquellos que son parasitoides de huevos están comprendidos por especies dentro, son todos himenóptera y son especies de, de las familias mimáride, eurófide, tricogramátide y afelínide. Eh, Dentro de este grupo de parasitoides de huevos, eh, pueden haber especies que son exclusivamente oófagas, o sea que atacan solamente al huevo cuando está recién puesto, o pueden haber especies que son embriófagas, o sea atacan a los huevos cuando son un poco más viejos, o hay algunas que pueden eh, desarrollarse sobre cualquiera de las dos. Perdón. En cuanto a los, al gremio que ataca a las ninfas y a los adultos, mayormente los que son vectores de, de silela son atacados por dípteros de, de la familia Picunculide, drínidos, o sea, familia drínide dentro de los eh, himenópteros, y los estresípteros alictrofagios. Puse como, pero solamente para información general, que también los, aunque no rincos, pero no los que son vectores de silela, pueden ser atacados por un lepidóptero que es parasitoide que ataca, pero ataca principalmente a fulgóridos. Los dípteros pipuncúlidos eh, son estas moscas que tienen una cabeza muy grande, con uñas grandes y un ovipositor exerto. Estas eh, especies funcionan como si fueran águilas que sobrevuelan el cultivo buscando a, a la chicharrita vectora y se lanza, la captura y en el aire le pone un huevo y la libera. Normalmente después del adulto de la chicharrita emerge una larva que empupa en el suelo. Los drínidos, eh, el grupo en el cual yo me 
soy especialista en taxonomía, están compuestos por estas avispas que la hembra se disfraza de, avis, de, de hormiga y el macho es una avispa común, son los únicos insectos que tienen el primer par de patas transformados en pinzas, eh, las larvas se las puede ver externamente eh, formando un saco. Después los estresísteros alectofágidos que atacan a, 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 los, a los potenciales vectores, principalmente a Cicadelini, y, y son eh, un orden de insectos muy curioso, de una biología muy particular, porque los machos son verdaderos parasitoides y las hembras son neonatas, o sea, nunca llegan a, a, a un estado libre y eh, funcionarían ecológicamente como un parásito. Eh, acá hice un resumen de eh, los dos gremios, de, de huevos y de ninfas y adultos, y los distintos grupos con potenciales vectores de estilela, para que eh, vean qué, qué familias de parasitoides los atacan. En general se considera que los parasitoides de huevos son aquellos que tienen una importancia en el control biológico, epidemiológicamente tendrían mayor relevancia, ya que impiden o estarían cortando el ciclo epidemiológico mucho más temprano, no permitiendo que emerjan, directamente no permite que emerjan las ninfas. Si bien, bueno, sabemos que las ninfas cuando mudan pierden, eh, si han comido en una planta enferma, pierden a la, al patógeno, pero lo mismo estaríamos evitando parte del ciclo de la enfermedad. Eh, los más importantes dentro de los parasitoides de huevos, fíjense que es donde casi todos los grupos son atacados por nimarios, y en cuanto a los parasitoides de ninfas y adultos, principalmente por pipunculios. Este, los cicaderini eh, son atacados, por ejemplo, por drínidos, pero eh, les cuento, yo hace 30 años fácil que trabajo con drínidos y he juntado, calculo, millones de, de chicharritas en el campo y solamente he podido personalmente yo capturé solamente tres veces ejemplares de eh, cicadelini atacados por delirios. Eh, bueno, acá hay una serie, un resumen eh, de, de distintos, eh, distintas especies, eh, las relaciones específicas en los distintos grupos, no voy a profundizar porque venimos un poco atrasados. Eh, en el caso de los cicádidos, les quería contar como un, eh, una curiosidad, si bien no son reconocidos todavía como vectores, pero fíjense que tienen parasitoides de huevo, que son mimarios, pero me pareció interesante comentarles una, un dato curioso, que eh, los adultos de las chicharras son atacadas por un género de dípteros que se llama emblemasoma, que las larvas se desarrollan dentro del, eh, del adulto y emergen de él. Lo interesante es que la mosca es atraída por el canto de la chicharra. Entonces hay trabajos científicos donde ponen eh, aparatos emitiendo el sonido de la chicharra los parlantes y cuentan el tiempo cuánto tarda en llegar la mosca a, a, al emisor de sonido. Era un, un dato curioso, ¿no? Bueno, en general, entonces, ¿qué situación tenemos? Si ustedes buscan en la literatura el conocimiento de los enemigos naturales de la mayoría de las especies vectoras, es muy escaso, es fragmentario, hay muy pocos datos. Es más, para la mayoría de las especies que son vectoras se conocen no más de cinco especies que son sus antagonistas o sus enemigos naturales. Eh, yo para eso entonces quería contarles, sabiendo esa situación, les quiero comentar un trabajo que hicimos eh, durante muchos, unos cuantos años, siete, ocho años acá en Argentina, buscando enemigos naturales de este, perdón, enemigos naturales de, este, de esta chicharrita que es tapajosa rubromarginata. Buscábamos solamente parasitoides de huevos. Tapajosa rubromarginata es la chicharrita más frecuente y abundante eh, en toda Argentina, eh, distribuida, fíjense, en siete provincias biogeográficas, ya van a ver un mapa a posteriori. Eh, está registrada, tiene más de 30 plantas hospedadoras y se, eh, se ha reconocido, se ha demostrado su capacidad vectora de silela para sí. En muchas ocasiones eh, son sus poblaciones muy abundantes, eh, unas cuantas redadas se pueden juntar o colectar muchos individuos, y esto puse la foto para que mostrarle cómo esto es un huevo nuevo de tapajosa, o sea que acá irían los parasitoides que son estrictamente ófagos, y un, los huevos que son embrionados. Bueno, 
Nosotros hicimos entonces un monitoreo de los parasitoides entre el 2001 y 2008, hicimos, pusimos huevos centinela, o sea, huevos puestos en plantas de cítricos, de huevos de esa chicharrita, en 137 localidades de toda la Argentina, como les decía, en distintas provincias geográficas, desde los 9 metros de nivel, sobre el nivel del mar hasta los 2.300 metros, expusimos un total de 10, más de 19.000 huevos. Acá pueden ver cómo eran las posturas, y bueno, en este caso justo que pusimos el huevo en el campo, apareció un parasitoide ya que empezó a buscar los huevos para parasitarlos. Estos son huevos de tapajosa parasitados por tricogramátidos, y estos son huevos parasitados por mimarios, acá pueden ver una avispita emergiendo. ¿Qué resultado tuvimos de esto? Bueno, eh, obtuvimos eh, avispas, emergieron avispas desde los huevos expuestos de más del 58% de las localidades, eh, con una tasa de emergencia cercana al 14%, o sea, fíjense que de, de cada 100 huevos expuestos, de 14 obteníamos avispas. Eh, la tasa de parasitismo que calculamos era entre 20 y 22%, si bien había localidades donde superaba por mucho el 50%. Eh, como resultado principal es que esta única especie de proconino en Argentina tenía, estaba afectada a su postura, a sus huevos, por 24 especies de parasitoides de huevos. 18 mimáridos, 5 tricogramátidos y un afelínido. Eh, como colorario, o sea, como resumen, eh, tengan en cuenta entonces eh, que la mayoría de los vectores tienen un rico complejo de enemigos naturales. Cuando ustedes vean una especie vectora que tiene pocos enemigos naturales, yo estoy casi seguro que la principal razón es porque está muy poco estudiado el complejo que la ataca. Bueno, con eso muchas gracias, eh, terminé. Yo le pido disculpas a mi grupo de trabajo porque no puse la foto, pero la verdad no es trabajo mío solo esta información, sino que tengo estudiantes y muchos colaboradores, tanto de, de mi instituto como de otros eh, eh, lugares acá de investigación en Argentina. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Eduardo, for your interesting talk. Eh, at this point, we're going to call all the speakers to the to the main table so we can start that debate part of this uh, session. Uh, we have time for some of questions that were uh, sent through the chat and some questions that were uh, especially designed for some of you, some of the speakers. Uh, the first question uh, we have is to Alberto. And the question is, it says, We already know from EPG studies with Filenus spumarius that the XE waveform is associated with inoculation of Xylella fastidiosa by this spiruldop bug. Can we infer that XE waveform is related to presivarial bulb fluttering as hypothesized for the C1 waveform of sharpshooters? Alberto? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, actually the XE waveform, which we defined uh, recently as the one associated to the transmission of Xylella, uh, it's very similar to the one uh, proposed by Ellen Bacchus, which is the which she called X waveform, and within the X waveform, um, she divided it in different. Uh, let's say sub waveforms. C1 waveform is one that is related with the spikelet bursts that she calls. And these spikelet bursts, uh, she has hypothesized that is, they, they are related with uh, valve fluttering. Well, uh, yes, uh, with the XE waveform, we see the same uh, signals, very similar. Although we use the DC system and she used the AC system, We can compare the two waveforms and they resemble uh, very much. And I, I think we could propose also that these uh, spikelet bursts are reflecting what it's called the valve fluttering, which is related with the ingestion of Xylella from the presivarial region. So yes, the answer would be yes. Thank you, Alberto. I'm following this question. 
there is another one related that with your answer that is yes that uh, that this uh, transmission efficiency differences can be related to possible differences in insect forgots such as anatomy of the presivarium channel or the presivarial valve yes there has been some very nice work uh, which is being conducted and has been conducted in the past by Italian researchers in Rodrigo's Almeida's lab and they showed that the anatomy of the presivarium channel and presivarial valve of sharpshooters is quite different to the anatomy of the Philenus spumarius valve and also a presidential region in general. So, yes, one of the differences between the efficiency of transmission, uh, as you know, sharpshooters transmit with higher efficiency than the Philenus and, and the, the copy, uh, could be related with uh, differences in anatomy of those two groups of insects, sharpshooters and spittle. So yes, also in this case, uh, there is data already published that they show that the anatomy of both groups of insects uh, in the Siberia region are quite different. Thank you, Alberto. We have a third question for you, from you, for you, from Fernando Salas del Instituto Biológico. He says, dear Alberto, could the transmission of Silella fastidiosa be used as a model for transmission of zebra chip in potato? Well, uh, the transmission of this um, foreign associated bacteria, uh, which is the, the one that is uh, associated to several chip, which is the Liberibacter uh, solanacearum species, as it is a phloem limited bacteria, the mechanism of transmission is a little bit different. It would resemble more the um, transmission of persistent viruses, phloem related viruses, which I, I think I showed a slide today on the transmission of uh, circulative viruses during the phloem phase uh, by uh, Citobiona bene, by an AFI. So no, the Silella fastidiosa is transmitted in a different way. It, it's, it look, it's the mechanism of transmission could be, could have some relationship in the sense that Silella uh, fastidiosa is inoculated in the silent vessels by ingestion, while the transmission of zebra chip, we believe that it's by salivation into the phloem chip elements. So there is not so much connection or relationship between the two transmission mechanisms. Thank you, Albert, for your answer. Now we have a question for uh, Barbara. Uh, it says, besides Cercopidae, what other groups of psyllium feeders are able to transmit Silella fastidiosa? Uh, aparte de Cercopidae, ¿qué otros grupos de, eh, de insectos que se alimentan de Silema pueden transmitir Silella fastidiosa? Sí, sí, eh, lo que no sé es si hace referencia a... Sí, obviamente, ¿no? Como dijimos, eh, hay otros grupos que pueden estar involucrados en la transmisión. No sé si está hablando en algún lugar en particular. Nosotros acá, en, ya vimos, ¿no? En Europa, todos los alimentadores de Silema podrían estar involucrados en la transmisión, pero hay tres grupos, como los cercopoidia, los cicadoidea y los cicadeline desde ya, son comprobados vectores. Otros grupos, eh, hay eh, alimentadores del floema que son capaces de adquirir la bacteria pero no capaces de transmitirla, eh, por lo menos hasta el momento. No sé si hace referencia a algo en particular por ahí, porque si no, sí si ya hablamos de, de todos los grupos que son capaces de transmitir. Thank you, Barbara. There is another question for you. It says, do we have abundant species of cicadas in affected crops, for example, citrus, olives, or plum in South America? that could be investigated as possible vectors of Silella fastidiosa? Sí, en realidad eh, voy, a, voy a dar mi respuesta en función al trabajo que venimos haciendo eh, en cítricos y recientemente en olivos. En cítricos trabajamos, por lo menos en Argentina, hace muchísimos años, desde, desde los 90, y en, tenemos muestreados todas las zonas citrícolas, 
este, tanto cítricos como toda la vegetación circundante. Y la verdad es que la ocurrencia de cícadas o de cicadoidios en los cultivos afectados y también en los no afectados es muy baja. Yo creo que no tenemos directamente, no hemos registrado alguna, podríamos llegar a tener, pero es una, un ejemplar en muestreos, uno o dos ejemplares en muestreos de mucho tiempo. No, 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 no tienen relevancia respecto de lo que son, sí, por ahí los cicadelinos y también todo lo que es, este, lo que puede llegar a ser los cercópilos, ¿no? No, tanto para cítricos como para olivos. Y creo que en Brasil este, pasa más o menos lo mismo. Thank you, Barbara, for your answer. Now we have a question for Francisco. Uh, and the question is, manage, management of ground vegetation, herbaceous plants in olive orchards in Europe, seems to be a good strategy to control Pilenos espumarios in the spring. Do you see any possibility of controlling this spillable vector also on the woody hosts during the summer? Okay, it's a good question. Well, uh, firstly, I think that uh, uh, as many other colleagues in here in Spain uh, think the same, the best moment to control population of uh, Philanus spumarius is in the nymphal stage because it's, a, it's the moment where the population, uh, the, the individuals are not, uh, have not uh, high mo mobility. It's sure that they are in advanced plants and you can control then the population. But talking about adults, when the adults are able to pass from the advanced plant to the, to the booty host, okay? Uh, the, the, the management of some herbaceous plants could be a good idea because uh, we have uh, done some studies and for us it's, it's sure that Philanus uh, spumaris prefers herbaceous plants than woody plants. We have done many experiments at the lab at, and at the greenhouse, of course, but uh, they prefer the, the herbaceous plant than the woody plant. So the use possibly of some uh, trap plants or some uh, uh, certain plants uh, near the 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 plot of the of the woody plants could be a, a system to avoid that the adults pass to the to the to the to the plot to the crop because they, they if they if they have near of the of their their population they have some herbaceous plants to to live in it's sure that they prefer these plants to to the other for example uh, it's not a, a very high experiment but we have done an experiment in the greenhouse uh, providing uh, the 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 plants of uh, uh, I, the name is alfalfa plants of uh, alfalfa for the reading of the of, of reading of philenus spumarius and we have put near of this alfalfa many several plants of woody plants and in summer if the if you are uh, uh, with the alfalfa uh, in good conditions the the adults prefer to keep to stay in the alfalfa not to go to the woody plants so i think that there's a possibility to manage the, the presence of the of the adults of filarius in the woody plants using this herbaceous plant as traps or as shelter for the for the population of the adults. It's a possibility. Thank you, Francisco. We have a question for Eduardo, uh, and the question is: What are the main reasons for the lack of studies on natural enemies of insect vectors of Silella? Lack of scientists difficult to use them in applied biological control? Eh, gracias a Joyce. Eh, yo pienso que eh, hay una combinación de ambas cosas. Eh, por un lado, por lo menos en Sudamérica o en Argentina en particular, eh, los subsidios para posibles proyectos de control biológico son bastante escasos y los científicos dedicados a la sistemática y taxonomía de enemigos naturales también eh, son escasos. Eh, en, principalmente también hay que tener en cuenta que para cada enemigo, o sea, para cada vector en particular, habría que estudiar qué complejo de enemigos naturales tiene en, en esa zona también. Entonces, eh, sí, pero es, realmente es sorprendente lo poco que se sabe de enemigos naturales pero no solamente vectores de Silela, 
de, de chicharritas, o sea, de místeros, aunque no ricos en general, a nivel mundial se conoce bastante poco de enemigos naturales. Eh, no sé si con, con eso le contesto a Joy. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, we're just finishing this part of the debate. I have a, maybe a question for anyone who wishes to, to answer. It's about molecular taxonomy. You have been talking about all the species and the, uh, there's a lot of species. How is this taken in account in, in this type of, of family vectors related to Silela? Does it, uh, is it an important issue or, or a working working subject or or does it is not helping at all at this point of the of the research on the knowledge of vectors in in this hepatosystem Barbara uh, Sí <laughs> okay Um, creo que sí, hay, está empezando a haber como más interés en llevar adelante ese tipo de estudios, pero no es lo principal, no es lo que, por lo menos acá, en, en Sudamérica, eh, hacemos. Creo que en Europa, si no recuerdo mal, algo se está trabajando con los afrofóridos, pero no, no es, por lo pronto, algo que uno vea que está creciendo el estudio en ese sentido. Adelante, Francisco. No, if, I think, and I don't know if Alberto uh, is uh, with me in this opinion, that in, in Europe the situation is that at the moment we have only one, two species involved in the transmission of Silela. So the, the need to use molecular taxonomy to differentiate between a species one, we have only one or two Free, and this is until now enough with the uh, morphological uh, taxonomy. I think is is one point that that is with that the, the molecular studies of uh, uh, vectors of Stilella is not a, an important or one main research for, for for us in Europe. I don't know if you think similar or not, Alberto. Yes, yes, I agree. Uh, molecular taxonomy uh, solves problems uh, which are related with uh, diversity or species that could be not identified morphologically easy, uh, but this is not the case because uh, phylenos from neophylenos is quite easy to distinguish morphologically. And also uh, I agree that the few insects that we think are involved in the transmission don't need the, the help of, uh, of molecular taxonomy. Because uh, uh, transmission is a matter of numbers, as I uh, tried to explain. You have very few insects, uh, very unusual insects uh, that land and, mm, on, a, on a susceptible crop. They have no epidemiological relevance. The ones that are abundant and that they really land and probe on, an, on a healthy plant are the ones that we need to identify. And as, I, as you said, uh, We only have two, three species in Europe that have been identified. Mm -hmm. Perhaps in the Americas, there are more species uh, involved yeah. and there might be some more application of molecular taxonomy. Thank you. We have the last question maybe now, it's uh, to Alberto. And the question is how EPG studies benefit the ultimate or end users or farmers? How can this information go and, and be a benefit to, to field to field to the farmers? Well, uh, it could be uh, very interesting to know that when we started uh, 35 years ago with EPTs, which is basically a, a very, very um, specific technique, very far away from practical uh, Uh, applications, uh, we thought it was not going to be so useful. And now uh, this technique is being used by many companies, for example, to register their compounds, their chemical compounds, because this technique allows, for example, to identify chemicals that can reduce um, aphid feeding, for example, or can interfere with virus transmission. So uh, in order to identify Uh, which molecules are really relevant to reduce transmission of plant viruses. The companies 
use these techniques or they make collaborations with uh, institutes to, to use these techniques. So it's, it's, very, it's a very applied technique actually to uh, screen for resistance, for example, it has been also been used to find the host plants or plants that could be resistant to insects. And also uh, it can be used to understand the transmission mechanisms as I explained today. Thank you, Alberto. Okay, with these questions, we are coming to the end of this uh, virtual session number two. In representation of the organizing committee, I would uh, again thank all the speakers, Alberto, Barbara, Eduardo and Francisco for your participation, for your answers, your questions, and also to the listeners, to the persons that in this virtual session number two. Uh, just a reminder that uh, this is, we have uh, still three more sessions and you can check the website of this workshop for more information. And that the next one, the next virtual session will take place on August 18th and it will start at 11 a.m. Uh, Brazil, Sao Paulo time. Uh, this uh, this uh, topic or the topic of this third session would be disease diagnosis and monitoring of Silela fastidiosa. I hope this was a very valuable for you, for the people that were listening about vectors and, and how it, it's related to Silela. And have a good afternoon or good, good morning. And we'll see you in the next session in, in one week.